Tony, our next guest is the is the winner of the Nobel Prize for Peace. And would you please welcome a very outstanding and controversial gentleman, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> that the war is so unjust, so abominable, so futile and bloody and costly, we are on the losing end both there and at home because as long as the war continues, our social problems will inevitably suffer here at home. The time has come for America to hear the truth about this tragic war. There comes a time when silence is betrayal. The truth of these words is beyond doubt, but the mission to which they call us is a most difficult one. Even when pressed by the demands of inner truth, Men do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy, especially in time of war. Nor does the human spirit move without great difficulty. Against all the apathy of conformist thought within one's own bosom, there has never been such a monumental dissent during a war by the American people. This reveals that millions have chosen to move beyond the prophesying of smooth patriotism to the high grounds of firm dissent based upon the mandates of conscience and the reading of history. I have taken a position against the administration's policy, and uh, I would hope that the president means what he says when he uh, says that there should always be room for dissent. And we come to a tragic period in our nation when we equate dissent with disloyalty. I don't think our loyalty to the country should be measured by our ability to kill. I think our loyalties to the country should be measured by our ability to lead the nation to higher heights of democracy and to the great dream of justice and humanity. Uh, I believe firmly uh, that uh, it is necessary to have these moments of dissent in order to challenge something that may be leading the whole nation do you, down the wrong do path. Do you care if you have lost favor with Mr. Johnson? The important thing is that I not lose favor with truth and with what conscience tells me is right and what conscience tells me is just. I'm much more concerned about keeping favor with these principles than keeping favor with a person who may misunderstand the position I take. Uh, there's always the danger that any nation will abuse its power. But I think that's an even greater reason why uh, we should restrain our power. And uh, I think our power must be much more than military power. We don't need to prove to the world or anybody our military power. I think we've got to prove our moral power. Do now. you feel that this nation has abused, uh, as you say, uh, their power? And I have no doubt about that. I'm not saying that it was done uh, with evil motives in mind. I think we made a huge miscalculation. And when you make a mistake, you ought to confess it. And I think the time has come now for our leaders to say that we've made a grave mistake. And we ought to take the initiative in bringing an end to this conflict. Things have gotten worse, particularly in the economic area. And I think the... Uh, impatience is very deep, and uh, the discontent is very broad, and if something isn't done with haste to remove the intolerable conditions that exist in our communities all over the nation, then I see us sinking into darker nights of social disruption. It is estimated that we spend $500,000 to kill each enemy soldier while we spend only $53 
for each person classified as poor. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor and attack it as such. Perhaps the more tragic recognition of reality took place when it became clear to me that the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. We were taking the young men who had been crippled by society and sending them 8,000 miles away to fight and die. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problem. But they ask, and rightly so, what about the war? They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problem. And I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. They are products of the problem rather than causes of the problem. And I always have to think of the fact that it's very easy to take our visions from the causal basis, from the, the root of the problem, and see the consequence out here and begin to uh, major on that. I think that uh, the things that I'm saying and the things that I'm trying to do and all of the people in the move, peace movement are trying to do are really geared toward uh, bringing the boys back home. In other words, we are trying to prove to be their best friends by uh, uh, doing something to bring about the climate that will bring an end to this war. Well, I think we have to look at several things here. First, in my mind, peace is much more important than faith. And I think there has to be a transformation here in terms of our thinking, uh, and in terms of, of peace, we've got to come to see now that peace must not only be a goal that we talk about and seek, but a means by which we arrive at that goal. I don't think of it as uh, a weak force, but I, I think of love as something strong and that uh, organizes itself in powerful uh, direct action. Now, this is what I try to teach in the struggle in the South, that uh, we are not engaged uh, in a struggle that means we sit down and do nothing. Uh, that there's a great deal of difference between non-resistance to evil and non-violent resistance. Uh, non-resistance leaves, uh, leaves you in a state of stagnant passivity and deadening complacency, wherein non-violent resistance means that you do resist in a very strong and determined manner. I think it uh, does something to cut, touch the conscience and uh, establish a sense of guilt. It, it disturbs this, this sense of contentment that he's had. Now, so often people respond to guilt by engaging more in the guilt evoking act in an attempt to drown the sense of guilt. The other thing is that a man of conscience can never be a consensus leader. He doesn't take a stand in order to search for consensus. He's ultimately a molder of consensus. And I've always said that the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and moments of convenience, but where he stands in moments of challenge and moments of controversy. And I would take this position even if I didn't have a majority of people agreeing with me now. Let me say finally that I oppose the war because I love America. I speak out against this war, not in anger, but with anxiety and sorrow in my heart, and above all with a passionate desire to see our beloved country stand as the moral example of the world. I speak out against this war because I'm disappointed with America. And there can be no great disappointment where there is no great love. We are presently moving down a dead-end road that can lead to national disaster. A 
America has strayed to the far country of racism and militarism. All men are brothers. All men are created equal. Every man is an heir to a legacy of dignity and worth. It is time for all people of conscience to call upon America to come back home. Come home, America. There will be no meaningful solution until some attempt is made to know these people and hear their broken cries. We have destroyed their two most cherished institutions, the family and the village. This is the role our nation has taken. The role of those who make peaceful revolutions impossible by refusing to give up the privileges and the pleasures that comes from the immense profits of overseas investment. When profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, militarism, and economic exploitation are incapable of being conquered. We as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin to shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our present policies. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. It will look across the seas and see individual capitalists of the West investing huge sums of money in Asia, Africa, and South America only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the countries and say this is not just Western arrogance of feeling that it has everything to teach others and nothing to learn from them is not just. A true revolution of values will lay hands on the world order and say of war, this way of settling differences is not just. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And it is a sad fact the Western nations that initiated so much of the revolutionary spirit of the modern world have now become the arch anti-revolutionaries. Our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit, declaring eternal hostility to poverty, racism, and militarism. A genuine revolution of values means in the final analysis that our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. Every nation must now develop an overriding loyalty to mankind as a whole in order to preserve the best in their individual societies. This call for a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class, and nation is in reality a call for an all-embracing, unconditional love for all men. This often misunderstood and misinterpreted concept, so readily dismissed by the Nietzsche's of the world as a weak and cowardly force, has now become an absolute necessity for the survival of mankind. Men will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations will not rise up against nations, neither shall they study war anymore. And I don't know about you, I ain't gonna study war no more.